In this video, we're going to look at experiment 20, which focuses on the electrolysis of water. So um, to get us started, I'm going to throw up the reaction here for the electrolysis of water. And basically what we're doing is, is we're taking water, we're adding some energy, and we're breaking it down into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, so you'll notice that the stoichiometry here is uh, for every uh, two water molecules that are consumed, we're going to make um, a ratio of two hydrogens to every one mole of oxygen. And that's just because there's twice as many hydrogens than there are oxygens in the water molecule. So now, in terms of electrolysis, the question is, in this, in this experiment, um, we're going to find out that this reaction is an example of a non-spontaneous reaction. And because it's non-spontaneous, we need to put in energy. So what we're going to discover today is where does the energy um, where do we get the energy from when we're doing a non-spontaneous reaction under electrochemical conditions? So how do we how do we put energy in? And this is not like in the case of a uh, reaction where we're looking at thermochemistry. So in chapter six, this energy would have been in the form of heat. And you could do this. You can take water and heat it up high enough, and it will break down into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, but in that, in this case, we're not going to be using heat energy. We're going to be using electrical energy. So the energy today is going to be coming from uh, electricity, and we're going to talk about where that comes from and, and how we can measure that energy. So in the electrolytic reaction, we have water breaking up into hydrogen and oxygen. We can also configure this cell because remember, every chemical reaction is reversible. If we were to go in the other direction we would have a spontaneous cell that could do work. So electrolysis, this reaction is a non-spontaneous, it has a, it'll, we'll find out it has a negative cell potential, a positive delta G and therefore requires work. But we can always flip this thing around and if we flip it around in the reverse direction, we're gonna get a spontaneous reaction um, that has a positive cell potential and can do work. So I'd like to introduce to you a little bit uh, as an application of this, I'd like to introduce the concept of what, um, since we're going to be making the electrolytic cell in this virtual lab, I'd like to show you what application the opposite spontaneous cell would have. And in this case, um, fuel cells, which power cars, are an electrochemical cell that is based on the spontaneous reaction uh, of the combination of hydrogen and oxygen to make water and energy. And in a fuel cell powered car, uh, your fuel source would be hydrogen, the oxygen would come from the air, and your only product would be water and energy. So this is considered to be one of the, the green technologies, one of the green ways of um, powering cars that would not produce carbon dioxide. So in a fuel cell power plant, the way this works is we would have an anode and a cathode. And at the anode, we would be doing unoxidation. So our hydrogen would be oxidized to two protons and two electrons, and then those electrons would go through an external circuit where they would come back to the cathode and they would take oxygen and some of the protons that were made at the anode. The protons go across what we call a membrane, and then um, this reacts with the, the electrons that are coming in from the anode, and then we make water. So our product in this case is water. So in a fuel cell powered car, we would use hydrogen as our fuel source and uh, that would make the car down, go down the road. This, the, uh, the electrical current that's passed from the anode to the cathode would go through the motor, the electrical motor, and turn the wheels of the car. So now an important question is, um, with any technology, is, well, okay, so this is great. We make water and um, we can make some energy and we can run our car, but we have to make our fuel somehow. So that requires us to go in the opposite direction here. I mean, this is not, we can't just make up energy from it, from, from, we can't just create energy from nowhere. So in the case of a fuel cell powered car, we have to make hydrogen. Now, the way that you could do this is by burning fossil fuels to make hydrogen, in which case that would be a total waste of our time because instead of um, creating the emissions at the point of the car, we would be making our emissions somewhere else. So the goal here is, um, and the, the reason why we're going to study this reaction is because electrolysis, um, if we can find a way of doing electrolysis where we don't get our energy from hydrocarbons, but if we get our energy from the sun, for example, meaning if we can take solar energy and convert the solar energy into electrical energy using like a solar cell, for example, that's what solar cells do. They take light energy and convert it to electricity. 
if we can hook that up to an electrolyzer to make hydrogen, now we have a way of making a fuel without necessarily having any carbon emissions. So you can see how the electrolytic reaction is tied to the galvanic reaction, and both are incredibly important. The, electro the galvanic reaction is used to make energy, and the electrolytic reaction is used to make the fuel for the um, galvanic reaction in this cycle. And if we can get our energy inevitably from the sun, that would be ideal. So uh, today, though, we're not going to be getting our energy from the sun. We're going to be getting our energy just from the wall socket that we use in the lab. And I'll explain that in the next couple of slides. OK, so let's look at the water splitting reaction. So what we're doing is we're taking two water molecules and we're breaking them into hydrogen and oxygen. And we're doing this in the presence of an acid. So the acid in this case is going to be giving us a source of H+. And the reason why that's important is because our half reactions for this are going to be 2H+, plus, plus 2 electrons gives H2. This is why we need the sulfuric acid around, to give us a source of some protons. And then on the other side of the, the scheme are, so this is the 2H plus plus 2 electrons gives H2. In the case of the electrolytic cell, this is going to be our cathode. So our anode in this case is going to be the oxidation of water, which makes oxygen, 4H plus, and 4 electrons. And when you hook these two things up together, you get the overall reaction for this cell. So now we have to go and we have to figure out, well, what are our standard reduction potentials for the way this thing is hooked up? So if this is going in this direction and this is going in this direction, when we look up our standard reduction potentials, these are always reported as reductions. So in this case, our uh, anode is going to, our, our cathode is going to be in the correct direction. Um, so we can take this value as it is, but you can see that our anode is going to be flipped from the standard reduction potential. So we would have to change the sign of this if we wanted to do it. Or the other way of doing it would be to take that to take E cell is equal to the uh, standard reduction potential of the cathode, which is zero volts, minus the standard reduction potential of the anode, which is positive 1.23 volts, which gives us an overall cell potential for this reaction of minus 1.23 volts. So automatically, when we get a negative cell potential, there are some things that we need to think about. So what does a negative cell potential mean? Well, this means that when we do minus NFE to get delta G, um, our delta G is going to be a positive value. And now if we go to chapter 18, there's going to be several things that we know is going to be true when we have a positive delta G. First thing, the reaction is going to be non-spontaneous. So if that's the case, then to make this thing work, meaning to make this thing go forward, we have to impart work on the system. So we have to put energy in in order for this process to occur. So then how do we supply the external energy? This is the big question. Where are we going to get that energy from? And today we're going to be uh, in our virtual lab. Uh, well, if you were in lab, um, in our virtual lab, we're going to do this. We're going to use this system virtually. Um, we're going to use what we call a constant current system. So you'll notice that the most important thing about this is that it has a plug that plugs into the wall. So this is taking energy that comes from um, a power generating plant somewhere. Far, it could be close or far away, but it's not inside of the building. This is electricity that's being transported from a coal or a natural gas, or um, since we're on Con Ed, this, this might come from the last uh, vestiges of Indian Point nuclear power plant. Somewhere, someone is making electricity and is being transported to the wall socket, which we're plugging into. So inevitably, our source of energy is the electricity that's coming in from the wall. Now, what this box does is it takes the electricity that's coming in and it converts it from an, um, from an oscillating signal, from a uh, AC signal, which is an alternating current, meaning the current is going backwards and forwards in an alternating pattern, to what we call direct current. And direct current is just current that goes in only one direction. So what this box does is this, this takes a, uh, an alternating current signal and converts it to a direct, a direct current signal. And then it applies that direct current to these two electrodes. So in essence, we're taking, we're creating, and we're creating a place where we have a source and sink for electrons, and um, a unit that gives us a voltage and current. So if you think to, you, if you think back to your high school physics, uh, electrical power requires two things. 
we need a field which is like which is voltage and if you remember this voltage is kind of like the the gravitational field right if you push a boulder up a hill what's going to want to happen is as you constantly push that boulder up and push the boulder up you're imparting upon it a higher and higher potential energy and then when you let the boulder go all objects want to be closer to earth it rolls down the hill and it gives it converts that potential energy to kinetic energy now in with electricity we don't have a gravitational field we have a, a voltage field or a potential field now if you remember electrons are charged and they have a negative charge so electrons want to be close to things that are positive and away from things that are negative so when we have a field a field is basically an area where we have some negative and an area where we have some positive and those two areas are separated from each other in space so you can think of pushing the rock which is the electron as we push that rock toward a the negative side we're essentially pushing the rock uphill in our voltage field because it doesn't want to be going in that direction and then when we release the electron it goes spontaneously towards the positive and then it, it converts its um, energy into uh, it converts that potential energy into um, actual energy electrical energy so we need that voltage field in order to set up um, a directionality where electrons want to go and then the other thing we need is we need actual electrons to flow so you need the field basically gravity and you need the rock in, or electrons in order for you to get power so that's why power is equal to the current times the voltage so in this case our power today is going to come from the fact that we're applying a 5 volt voltage meaning this box takes the wall voltage and converts it to a 5 volt signal basically a 5 volt field so um, if you take the difference between the black and the red there's going to be a 5 volt difference between these two electrodes. So electrons are going to want to move from the black to the red with a field of 5 volts. And we're going to tune using this knob our current to get 0.1 amps. And we're going to talk about what the amp is in the next slide. So when you multiply these two together, when you multiply 0.1 amps times 5 volts, you get 0.5 watts. Now, one thing I want to point out is that a lot of the chargers that we use that are USB are 5 volt. So uh, it, it's not surprising why this system is 5 volt because um, pretty much all cell phone chargers convert, um, well, anything that's USB um, and, and our cell phone chargers convert AC signal to 5 volts. And then this, what makes this system special is that we can tune in the power by... Um, tuning in the current so if you look on your cell phone um, if you look on your cell phone charger you'll see that it has a wattage and then you could work out knowing that it's five volts how many amps are actually going through that and then what we have to understand is that now we have to link power to energy because power is not energy but power times time is energy so power in units of watts times time in units of seconds gives us the watt second which is energy or joules. You may have heard this um, out in the real world with kilowatt hours. When you're when you get with your meter at home, when you it, they meter electricity to your house, the unit that they meter is kilowatts or a thousand watts times the un unit of time hours, and then they get some unstandard amount of energy. But a kilowatt hour is a unit of energy, whereas a kilowatt is a unit of power. Okay, so let's look at the electrical current part of this. So we've looked at voltage. We know how to calculate the voltage. So in this case, um, we have a 5 volt system. So we can definitely, with 5 volts, run our cell. We need to apply at least minus 1.23 volts to get this thing going. We're going to give it 5 volts, which is more than enough electrical energy to make this process take place. So now the other thing that we have to supply is the electrical current, which is the flow of electrons. So if you remember back to class in chapter 19, current is, or I, is equal to Q, which is the charge in coulombs, divided by T, which is the time in seconds. And we have a very important relationship between um, charge in coulombs and moles of electrons. And we're going to explore this in more detail today. So the relationship between the number of electrons that we pass and the charge 
is that for every 96,485 coulombs, we've passed one mole of electrons past a given, a given point. So this allows us to relate the number of electrons to the charge. So now let's apply this to our reaction where we have uh, 2H plus plus two electrons goes to, to hydrogen gas. So now we're gonna be talking about these electrons. So let's look at one of the first consequences of these two equations. So if you take a look at the current, um, the current is basically a change in the charge with respect to a change in time. So if you remember, these little d's come from calculus. This indicates a, ch a change. And if you haven't taken calculus, you can think of, instead of this being a d, you can think of this as being the delta symbol, that little, triang that little triangular symbol that indicates um, uh, q2 minus q1 over t2 minus t1. So when we have... If, when we define a current, that's a change in the charge divided by a change in the time. So because we have Faraday's constant, and we know that for every certain amount of coulombs we pass, we have a certain number of moles of electrons we pass, we can use Faraday's constant to say, well, okay, um, given a fixed constant, there is a proportionality between the charge and the number of moles, and that's Faraday's constant. So we can say that really dq over dt is proportional to the number of moles that are changing with respect to time. And then because of stoichiometry, there's two electrons for every one mo molecule of hydrogen that's produced. Um, this comes from the balanced reaction. We can say, well, really, this is not only d moles of electrons, the change in moles of electrons, this is really proportional to the number of moles of H plus or the number of moles of hydrogen that we produce. And now if we have moles and we have a volume of solution, this becomes a concentration, meaning if we divide the number of moles that are changing by the volume of the solution, we have the change in concentration with respect to time and that's a reaction rate. So one thing that, that's incredibly important to understand is that the current that flows in an electrochemical reaction is directly proportional to the reaction rate. Meaning if we go back to the previous slide, when we're running this reaction and you turn this knob, which is changing the current, you are literally speeding up or slowing down the reaction. So if we go from 0.1 amps to 0.2 amps, we've doubled the rate of the reaction because we're doubling the flow of electrons and therefore we're doubling the amount of reactants consumed or products made. So that's an incredibly powerful thing to understand, that current is proportional to the reaction rate. Now, the other thing that's very useful in um, this experiment is if we know the charge, we can use Faraday's constant to predict how much product was made. So the charge in this case, if we reorganize this equation over here, is going to equal the current times the time. That's gonna give us coulombs. So once we have the coulombs, we can then do some stoichiometry to figure out how many moles of hydrogen we produce. Essentially, what I'm showing you is how we go through the top part of this, these steps, to show that the charge is related to the number of moles of one of the reactants. So if we start with our charge in coulombs, whatever that is, and we divide it by Faraday's constant, which says that 96,485 coulombs uh, are passed for every one mole of, I'm sorry, there are 96,485 coulombs for every one mole of electrons passed. We've now gone from charge to moles, and then we use stoichiometry in our balanced reaction to say, well, for every two moles of electrons that are passed, we get one mole of hydrogen that would be made. And now we have a pathway to go from charge to moles. So current and time can be used to determine the products created or the reactants consumed. So these are very powerful consequences of these two, react of these two equations. Okay, so now how do we set this experiment up? So I have a picture here. I know it's a little bit hectic, but we're gonna, we're gonna start to dissect it one piece at a time. So the first thing we have to do is we have to make our solution that we're gonna electrolyze. So this is the solution that's in this beaker. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 50 milliliters of a three molar sulfuric acid solution and combine it with 100 milliliters of deionized water. And we're gonna put all of that into a beaker. So we're gonna make 150 mils um, of, of combined solution with one third of it being three molar H2SO4. So if you do the math and you take 50 times three divided by 150, you're gonna get that the final concentration of the sulfuric acid is one molar. And that's actually important because remember under standard conditions, we need to have a 
solution concentration of one molar. So that's how we make the electrolyte that's in the beaker. Now, we need a way of collecting our gas. So how are we going to collect the gas? What we're going to do is we're going to take a burette, and you can see that right here, and we're going to we're going to um, flip it over upside down so that the bottom of the burette, the top of the burette, that little round hole at the top is inside of our solution. And then up at the very, very top is the stopcock, which we can close. And then if we bubble our gas into that burette, we not only have a way of storing the gas, but we have a way of measuring the volume of the gas that was made. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get that burette flipped over and put into the solution. And then we're going to take a bulb. Um, basically just a, a little, um, a little uh, plastic pipette bulb, and we're going to suck the solution up into the burette until we get 45 to 50 mils of water up all the way to the tippity top of that burette. So the reason why we're doing that is so that we can, um, when the gas starts to fill the burette up, it pushes the water down, and then we can measure the volume by looking at hey, where did we start the water level to where did we finish? So the water is going to go all the way up to the top here. And then as we bubble gas up into the top, the water gets pushed down and replaced by the volume of the gas that we make. So we're going to read off the, the liquid level at 48.3 mils. So we pumped up the water into here until we get up to 48.3 mils. Now we got to set up our power supply. So we set up our constant current system that was in the picture before. We're going to plug it into our vernier system. We're going to plug it into the wall over here. So you'll notice that this plug, if you follow the wires, comes all the way back to here. That's going to be our source of electricity. This is going to be our unit that's going to allow us to apply a 5 volt, a five volt um, field from the red to the black wire and allow us to turn this knob to change our current. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hook these electrodes up to some wires that go in. So um, the cathode where we're going to be doing our hydrogen production is the black wire. And you'll notice that the black wire is connected to the um, black lead on the constant current system. And we take that little wire and we allow it to go up and into the burette. So basically, this wire is going to be producing the hydrogen inside of our burette. And then we have the white wire, which we're just going to stick into the electrolyte somewhere else. And then that's going to be our anode where we're uh, oxidizing water and making oxygen. So we're, we're basically taking these two clips. We're clipping them up to two different wires, a black wire and a white wire. The black wire goes in the burette where we make hydrogen and the white wire goes in the electrolyte where we make oxygen. OK, so now that we have our constant current set up and we have our burette all filled up with water, we're going to turn on the constant current meter and set the current to 0.1 amps by turning the dial and monitoring the current on the computer screen. So we're going to turn this dial until the computer says, oh, this, this instrument measures 0.1 amp flowing. And then we're going to run the electrolysis until 20 mils of hydrogen gas is produced. Now let me show you what that's going to look like. So in this setup that we have, we're, this is almost, this is essentially completely identical to our setup, except um, we have, in this case, for demonstrative purposes, we have two burettes instead of one. So in this one, we're going to be collecting the hydrogen. This is going to be our cathode. 2H plus plus two electrons goes to hydrogen gas. And in our setup, we normally would not track the oxygen production um, just because we don't need to uh, for the experiment. But here I want to show you what it looks like. So this one would be the other wire. And this goes into another um, burette on this side. And we can actually capture the um, oxygen gas also. So let's take a look and see what happens once we turn that constant current meter on. So you'll notice nothing is happening now. And then all of a sudden, when we turn that current on, the gas bubbles start to form. And we start to make a gas that bubbles up to the top. And it fills up and pushes the water down in our burettes. So now as time goes on, you'll notice that as more and more gas is produced, more and more water is pushed down, and we can measure the volume that's produced by looking at the graduations. Now, obviously, these are just written on with um, magic marker, but our burettes would have uh, analytical graduations on them. And here's one thing I'd like to show you, too. So if you look, there's a noticeable difference in the amount of hydrogen that's produced versus the amount of oxygen that's produced. So if we go back a little bit until where our water level is 
right at that second mark. So let's pause it right here. So you'll notice that the hydrogen is at this second mark, this second graduation, and the oxygen has only reached the first graduation. Now that actually makes sense because if we look at our balanced reaction, for every one quantity of oxygen that we make, for every one graduation of oxygen, we should make two graduations of hydrogen. And we see that here. This is an example of a Monton's law in gases. The volume for when we produce two moles is twice that of the volume for one mole produced of oxygen. So this bubbling that you're seeing is the evolution of these gases at, from the, the wires that are exposed to the solution. So that's what the electrolysis would look like. For 20 minutes, you would see bubbles rising up and pushing the water level down in the burette. Okay, so once you've collected your approximately 20 mils, we have to do some post-electrolysis data collection. So the first thing we're going to do is we have to see, well, how much water was displaced. So we're going to carefully measure the water level at 27.83 mils. So we've gone from about 48 mils to down to 27.83 mils. That's going to be on your data sheet. And so obviously the difference between those two numbers is going to be the volume of gas that's in there. So now there's another important thing that we have to think about, and, and, that, and that is how long did it take us to do this, right? Because if we want to figure out a charge, we have to know what the current was, and that was 0 0.1 amps. We set that with the dial. Um, and we have to know how long did we allow that 0.1 amps to flow. Well, we allowed it to flow for 26 minutes and 33 seconds of applied current. Now, just to make a little note here, remember, um, when we multiply Q times T, we have to get the units right. So the units in this case have to be not minutes and seconds, but seconds. So you're going to have to convert this into uh, seconds when you're doing that calculation. Now, another thing that we're going to have to start doing is we're going to, since we collected a gas in our burette, if we want to figure out the number of moles of gas, we have to be thinking about the ideal gas law. So we're going to need some other variables like the pressure and the temperature. So let's start looking at those. So we use a temperature probe to record the water's temperature at 23 degrees Celsius. So we stick a thermometer in here and we measure the temperature at 23 degrees Celsius. That's one of the key variables in PV equals NRT. The other one that we need is the pressure. And this is a not straightforward calculation and it requires um, a few things. Oh, I have a little typo in here. So this should have read, instead of 345, this should have been 34.5 millimeters. That's just a little typo. So one thing we need to do is we need to measure the height of the water that's in the burette. And I'll explain why in a second. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a ruler and you're going to measure from the top of the water in the beaker to the top of the water that's in the burette. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is because in addition to the gas that's pushing down, we also have the water that's also pushing down. And then we have to also note what the barometric pressure is. So the barometric pressure in the room is 31.55 inches of mercury. That's going to be important for our calculation of the pressure. Okay, so now let's look at uh, how we can determine Faraday's constant. So our first goal in this uh, experiment is to uh, determine a value for Faraday's constant from the experimental data that we collected. So, and we need to do two things. We need to get the charge and we need to get the number of moles of electrons. So how do we obtain a value for the charge, Q? So what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, we're going to take our equation for current and we're going to say, well, the Q is going to equal I times T. So in this case, the current that we passed is in it was 0 0.1 amps and we have to remember that the unit of amps is coulombs per second so we have 0 0.1 coulombs per second we multiply that by the time which i gave you on the previous slide making sure that our units match in seconds and then we can get our charge now let's look at the mole part so as i said if we want to get the number of moles of a gas we have to use pv equals nrt and we have to remember that the units of r are special and important they're liters, atmospheres, moles, and Kelvin. So when we plug into this equation to solve for the number of moles, we have to make sure that our pressure is in atmospheres, our volume is in liters, and our temperature is in Kelvin to work with the gas constant of 0 0.08206 liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So we have all the variables, right? We have the temperature, that was 23 degrees Celsius. We can convert that to Kelvin. We have the volume, that's the difference in the volumes measured in the burette. And then we have the pressure, that's the barometric pressure, right? 
well, wrong. We have all the variables except the pressure is a little bit more complicated than just taking the barometric pressure. There are some things that we have to think about. So the first thing that we have to understand is, well, where is the pressure coming from? So the barometric pressure is these blue lines. The barometric pressure is pushing down on the water at the top of the beaker. So the water in the beaker is experiencing the atmospheric pressure. And then we have a balanced out pressure that's inside the burette. So the pressure inside the burette is coming from a few different things. So what is pushing on this water to push back against the atmospheric pressure? Well, obviously it's the hydrogen gas. That's one of the major components that we've added. We filled this, um, we filled this beaker, this burette up now with hydrogen gas. So that's going to be pushing down. We also have the fact that in inside of this burette, some of the water has evaporated and we're going to get a vapor pressure of water that's in there. So that hydrogen gas is going to be a mixture of hydrogen gas and water vapor. So this we can look up based on the temperature to get the vapor pressure. And then there's one other thing that we have to be concerned with. There's a little bit of water that's still up above the level of the water in the beaker. You can see that there's 34.5 millimeters of water that still rises up over the top of the water in the beaker. That water has some weight and it also pushes down against the force of the atmosphere. So we have to account for the fact that there's a pressure of the water column that's in there also. And the way that we do that is we just, we have a conversion factor where we take the height of the water, which is in millimeters, 34.55, I'm sorry, 34.5. And we know that for every 13.6 millimeters of water, every 13.6 millimeters of water, we have one millimeter of mercury. So we can account for that pressure by taking the vapor pressure of the water, which will be in millimeters of mercury, the pressure of the water column, which we can get by taking this height and dividing it by 13.6, and the barometric pressure, which I gave you was 31.55 inches of mercury. We we're gonna to have to convert that to millimeters of mercury to work in this equation. And then we can solve for what the actual pressure of the hydrogen gas is. So those are the, the, those are the things that we need to know. And that's why we measured the height of the water column that's why we measured the temperature of the water to get the vapor pressure, and that's why we measured the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so in the second part of this experiment, we have to do some data analysis. So Faraday's constant um, can be related to Avogadro's number. So um, one of the things that we're going to do in this experiment is we're actually going to determine an experimental value from Avogadro's number. Now, if we wanted to do this uh, in terms of if we wanted to get this value um, from the constants, we would need a relationship that would allow us to go between this side and this side. So essentially, the bottom of these two um, fractions are the same. We have mole of electron on the bottom here, and we have mole of electron here. So the unit conversion that we would need to get from this one to this one would be the charge per electron. If we knew the charge for every one electron, then we could get the number of electrons per mole of electrons. So what is the charge of an electron or coulombs per electron? So um, Millikan, um, if you look back in the early chapters of Ebbing, um, the Millikan oil drop experiment was how they first measured the charge of an electron. And the value that they got was 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs per electron. Now you can see why we use Faraday's constant and not the charge of an electron. The reason why we use Faraday's constant is because this is such a tiny number of, this is such a tiny amount of charge per electron that we would be using this, as, to use this as a unit conversion would be very difficult. So it's much easier in terms of everyday life in the lab to look at moles of electrons because we can relate moles to grams and then get our charge out from that. So that's why we use Faraday's constant, but Faraday's constant is, we can relate Faraday's constant to the number of electrons using this charge of an electron. That one, There's 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs per electron. So how are you gonna do that conversion? Well, you have your Faraday's constant that you're gonna measure. You're gonna take the charge that, that came out, you're gonna take the number of moles of electrons that came out, and then you're gonna multiply this by the fact that, well, for every 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, there's one electron. That's going to give you a number of electrons per mole of electrons, or Avogadro's number. 
So there's one other thing that I want to point out um, while we're here. In all of this, we've been saying per mole of electron. Now, in the previous slide, there's one important thing that you should take, take note of. The number of moles of hydrogen are, is not necessarily the same thing as the number of moles of electrons. If you go back and you look at our reaction, let's just find where that is. You have to remember that for every one mole of hydrogen gas, to produce that, we had to use two electrons. So you have to make sure that once you get the number of moles of hydrogen gas, you go back and account for your stoichiometry when you're plugging in to get Faraday's constant. So I want to point that out while we're here because this coulombs per mole of electron is not going to be coulombs per mole of hydrogen. This is going to be coulombs per mole of electron, which you're going to have to take the moles of hydrogen and get the moles of electrons. And then once you have that, it becomes very simple to get an experimental value for Avogadro's number. So here you're going to take whatever you got for your Faraday's constant, and now you know how to convert that into Avogadro's number. So let's look at the data sheet that you're going to get. So there's going to be an accompanying data sheet with this that's going to have all of the data for the virtual lab um, put into it. So the Burette readings that I had are here. Um, we started at 48.3, we ended at 27.83. So it's relatively simple to get our volume of hydrogen by doing the subtraction. And then I provide you with all of the variables you need in order to get the pressure of hydrogen gas. You have the temperature, you have the height of the water column, which we need in order to get the pressure. You have the barometric pressure, which was 31.55 inches of mercury. We're going to have to convert that to millimeters of mercury in order to use that to get the pressure. And then the vapor pressure, you can look up on page 313. There's a table with the vapor pressures um, as a function of temperature, and then you can get the value for the, va the vapor pressure. And then to get the pressure of hydrogen, you're going to use that equation that I gave you that um, specifies all of the things in the burette that are pushing against the atmospheric pressure. Once you have the pressure, then you can use PV equals NRT to get the moles of hydrogen produced. So that's how we're gonna get the moles of hydrogen. Then down here in this part of the data table, this is where you're gonna figure out your number of coulombs. So you have your current and you have your time in minutes and seconds. So you're gonna have to get the number of coulombs passed and then once you have all of this, you're going to get your value for the Faraday. So you're going to convert your moles of hydrogen to moles of electrons and then divide that by, uh, I'm sorry, and then you're going to take the, the current divided by the number of electrons to get your Faraday's constant here. And then the accepted value is the value that I gave you previously. And then Avogadro's number is going to be, you're going to use your experimental value for the Faraday and then how I showed you how to calculate Avogadro's number. And then right next to it, you're going to put the accepted value, which is you know 6.02 times 10 to the minus 23. And then you're going to show how you calculated both of those things. So this data sheet you'll complete and submit to your instructor via the Blackboard uh, assignment upload um, that will accompany this experiment. And um, if you have any questions, you can contact your section instructors.